screen. And nice to see everyone that's come along. Thanks for coming out this evening. Um, we are continuing in Philippians and chapter number one. We've been looking a little at this letter over the last couple of weeks, just since we restarted on a Tuesday uh, evening. And uh, we'll recommence, shall we, at the beginning of Philippians chapter number one. And uh, let's read together, shall we, from verse 1 of Philippians chapter 1. It says, Paul and Timotheus, or Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ even as it is meet for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defence and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let's just ask for God's help. Let's just bow our heads, shall we? Our Father, we do come into thy presence again this evening, and we thank thee for the living word of God. We thank thee, our Father, that we come together and uh, we are hungry. Each of us has a different need. But we give thanks, our Father, that thy Holy Spirit knows our need. And we thank thee for guiding us to this little letter. And we know, our Father, it was written in very uh, difficult circumstances. And we pray, Father, that as we would read it together, that we too might be encouraged and helped. We pray that thou would speak to us personally, individually. Help each one, we pray, Father. And we do just ask, our Father, for that blessing in the name and for the glory of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So our little studies in Philippians, uh, we've entitled uh, Letters from uh, Lockdown or Letters in Lockdown because this little letter was written by the Apostle Paul in the circumstances of his imprisonment. So uh, he was a great preacher of the gospel, as many of us know, uh, and yet for some reason part of God's plan was to take him out of circulation and to place him in the prison cell. I'm sure it's not what he would have intended. It didn't seem to me anyway to be a very... Uh, didn't seem to me to be a great plan. He was a man who was tasked with sharing the gospel with the whole world, and yet he's placed in a prison cell. Yet, as you read through the Philippian letter, it's a letter of constant encouragement. Uh, not just that the Apostle Paul sees uh, the bright side of, of things. It's not just that he sees the positive. or It's not just that he looks on the, on the bright side. You know, sometimes when we hit the difficulties of life, we don't look on the bright side for the simple reason that we don't even believe there is a bright side, there is a positive. But as you go through the Philippians, you don't just look on the bright side, but you actually see it. You actually see the positives. You see the way in which God has moved despite the very difficult circumstances and he's used it to bless the Apostle Paul and he's used it to bless others. In fact, some in this little letter have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ precisely because the Apostle Paul was taken out of the circulation in the world and he was put there in Caesar's palace. Do you remember? We noticed that last week. Uh, there's a little uh, verse there uh, later on in chapter number one of Philippians verse 13 so that my bonds in christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places uh, the fact that i'm in chains it's known throughout the palace or praetorium uh, and the praetorium was not just a place but it was the guards it was it was the the uh, private personal bodyguard of caesar so he's 
Paul has been taken out of the preaching place or the marketplace in the synagogue. He's been taken off the pulpit, if you like. He's been placed in the prison. You say, well, that's an absolute disaster. Well, not really, uh, because as, they, as God moves, God's in control, you see. As God takes him from the pulpit and places him in the prison, he gives him what you might call a captive audience. In fact, I, I don't think you could find any more of a captive audience than the audience that the Apostle Paul has in Philippians, because not only is he in prison, but apparently in those days what they did is they didn't just lock a door behind you, but they actually chained you to the guard. And then they locked the door behind you. So there was a captive audience. And, you know, it's very interesting that as you go through the Gospels and you look at how people are saved and how people come to know the Lord Jesus, it's not often, and certainly not always, but with big crowds. But it is so often, you, you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it is so often the Lord Jesus just with one person, just with the woman at the well, we remember her, or, or just with Nicodemus, uh, or, or just with the man that was lying by the pool and couldn't walk, and it was one. One and one, and the Lord Jesus' time had had the Lord Jesus had time just for the individual, and the work of God was done in that way. Well, here it's been done again, just with the ones and twos, and uh, it's lovely to see five thousand or seven thousand, as you read about sometimes in the New Testament. And it's great to read even uh, in recent times of many coming to to know the Lord Jesus. But oftentimes, you know, God will work personally, individually, just uh, between ones and twos. Well, that's the kind of background to the Philippian letter. Later. And uh, uh, last week, perhaps, we, we, did, we did just kind of hint at, we, we noticed that the Apostle Paul, in these difficult circumstances, he found that he could do three things. Three things you couldn't stop him doing. The first of them was praying. He prayed. And tonight we want to think a little bit more about his prayer, the prayer of the Apostle Paul. It's very interesting. And he also preached, as we mentioned, uh, at the end of chapter 1. He preached to those that he could preach to, the folks he was chained to, and some of them came to know the Lord Jesus. And then, of course, too, we, you might remember that in those experiences that he passed through, uh, there were things in his life that God could move and change and alter. And maybe, maybe we wouldn't choose to have our character changed the way that the Apostle Paul was. But uh, nonetheless, you go down chapter number one, verse 19, it says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation. You see, I've had a difficult year. Uh, I've, I've had a hard six months, Stuart. Uh, I'm looking back over even the last couple of years, maybe even the last 10 years, and they've been very, very hard. And that may be true. But you know, oftentimes what God produces at the end of these experiences is someone very, very different from the person they were at the beginning. Uh, and he changes us through experiences. He changes us through circumstances. There has been many an illustration of that in the Bible. Um, I'm thinking just to the top of my head there, Moses. Moses was a man that was, well, they, they used to say he, he was a man who learned to be something. He was a prince. He was at the top of the pile of Egypt. He thought he could do anything. But by the end of his life, the word of God describes him as the meekest man in all the earth. God changed him by the circumstances through which he passed. Well, let's look, look uh, together a little at this prayer then of the Apostle Paul. Uh, Philippians chapter number one. And uh, three little uh, aspects to this prayer uh, you, you, you might notice with me. Philippians chapter number one. You notice that he begins to pray. And verse number three, he begins with thanksgiving, which we've thought about uh, last week, I think. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. So he begins his prayer, I think, in the way that we all ought to begin our prayer. Here's a good place for us all to start. Thanksgiving. Um, to, not just to ask God for things. Good to ask God. Good to be specific. I don't think if we're specific we'll ever get answers. Uh, but uh, we begin with thanksgiving. And the Apostle Paul in particular here thanks God for the Philippians. You see, he can remember a day that there was nothing at Philippi. There were just uh, pagans at Philippi, devil worshippers at Philippi, people that had no idea about the true God. They, they would worship uh, uh, idols and, and so forth. But there's now at Philippi something different. There are people who were saved, people that came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, people who had heard that God was real, that there was one true and living God. There was only one way to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, and that God was so interested in them that he came into this world as the person of Jesus Christ and died on the cross for them, and they got saved. 
And it wasn't just that they believed a set of facts, but their lives were dramatically changed. And so he thanks God for them. And not only that, but every time he thanks God for them, he thanks God with joy. Verse number four. Uh, and uh, perhaps you might remember, we did notice that, well, we wondered why, why, why that would be. Why, why would he thank God with joy every time he remembers the Philippians? Would it be the fact that everything about them was perfect? <laughs> Did you think about the folks in, that come to the Gospel Hall here in New Cumnock and every single one was absolutely perfect? They'd never done anything that would upset it. I don't think that was the idea. Uh, Paul was putting into practice what he preached. You see, Paul preached grace. This is a great Bible word. A good place to start in our study and understanding of the Word of God. Paul preached grace. He preached the fact that God sees us through the shed blood of his son. He sees us sometimes when we go out into the bright sunlight, don't we? We, we put on our sunglasses and we see the world in a different way. It becomes uh, filtered. Well, when God looks upon a sinner, he sees that sinner through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. He sees them filtered, in a sense, through Calvary. When I come to know the God of heaven, when I come to put my trust in his son, Jesus Christ, God sees me in a completely different way. He doesn't just see me as someone who broke his laws, as someone who offended him, as someone who messed up their life, but he sees me uh, in, the, in the fact that Jesus Christ loved me and died for me. And that relationship between me and God is totally different because he's a God of grace. He does not give me what I deserve, but he pours out his blessing. He forgives my sin. He gives me new life, a new start, and a new hope in eternity. He's a God of grace. Now, you see, it would be a very strange thing for the Apostle Paul to preach to the sinner that God's a God of grace and then to come to the Christian and hammer them into a little pulp, wouldn't it? It'd be a very strange thing. And the Apostle Paul uh, not only preaches grace, but he practices grace. That's good. And so he looks at the Christians at Philippi, and he looks at them in the eyes of grace. And yes, there are problems at Philippi. You can read through in chapter 4, you'll find there were problems at Philippi. There certainly was. But he deals with them in the same way that God dealt with him. And that's such a great lesson, isn't it, in the Christian life? But we need to deal with others the same way that God dealt with us. We deal with them in grace, in kindness. Well, it begins with thanksgiving, this, this prayer, verse 3 and 4. And then do you notice, too, um, it, it, it continues with, with some encouragement. I noticed that. This is a great encouraging letter, I think. I think in the, in the Philippian letter, Paul encourages in at least three ways. He encourages, first of all, with his person. He encourages with the fact that he's going through difficult circumstances, and yet even although he's in prison and passing through dif difficult circumstances, he's rejoicing in the Lord Jesus. So he encourages personally. You know, you've got problems at Philippi. Well, listen, so have I. But I'm, I'm enjoying the presence of the Lord Jesus. I'm getting to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the Lord Jesus, even in these circumstances, is changing me and saving souls. So he encourages with his person. He encourages as well with his pen. As you read through Philippians, I think you'll find that this whole letter uh, is full of encouragement. But thirdly, here in this little section we're reading about, he encourages with his prayers. He encourages with his prayers. There's the Apostle Paul, uh, perhaps the greatest preacher that there has ever been in the world, and he's praying for the Philippians. That's encouraging, isn't it? It's encouraging to know that people are praying for us. I remember, maybe shared it before, I think I have, but I think one of the, um, one of the most encouraging experiences I've had in, in recent years, um, I remember um, working on, at the weekend uh, on, with the on-call service, and uh, I went along to a nursing home uh, down at Prestwick. And I was met at the door by a, a chap I knew. I knew he went to one of the churches in Ayrshire, and he knew me and I knew him. And uh, as we were going to see a patient, he happened to chat away. He said, you know, there's a wee lady in this uh, nursing home. He says, she was in one of the gospel halls in Ayr. He says, and I hear her praying every night. I suppose she might have been a bit deaf. And when you're deaf, maybe you pray quite loud. And I think she was praying quite loud. And maybe everybody in the nursing home heard her praying, but that's not a bad thing, is it? Uh, he said, you know, I listen to her praying every night. He said, do you know that she prays for you and she prays for your family? Well, I found that very, very encouraging 
someone that, you know, I didn't even recognize the name. I honestly didn't recognize the name. But I had been at the church on a number of occasions sharing the word of God. And she remembered us each evening in her prayers. I find that tremendously encouraging. Well, here is the Philippians. And, and you know, the Apostle Paul is remembering them in his prayers. I think that's a great encouragement. But not only that, but he's going to encourage them even with the content of his prayers. Look at that great encouragement in verse number six. Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's encouraging, isn't it? That as the Apostle Paul thinks about the Philippians, he's, he's looking at the work of God in them and he's confident that God is going to make progress with their life. I, I think that's good. If there's one thing, there's quite a few things you could see about Philippians, but one of the things that I can see in Philippians is this. There's progress to be made in all of our lives. <laughs> I think you'll see that as you go through it. Even as you get to the Apostle Paul in chapter number three, he says something quite remarkable uh, in verse number 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, Either we're already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. In other words, I'm making progress day by day. I'm getting to know the Lord Jesus day by day. I'm enjoying the new life in the Lord Jesus, the resurrection life presently. I'm making progress. Well, if Paul can make progress, I think maybe there's room for progress in all of our lives. And even there in the Philippians, Paul is confident uh, that God is going to complete and perform that work. They're going to make progress in the things of the Lord Jesus. How does God do that? How does God change us? How does he make progress in our lives? How does he perform that good work in verse 6 in us? Well, it begins, doesn't it? It begins with conversion. It begins with that very first step. You see, from the moment we're born uh, until we come to know the Lord Jesus, we're really separated from God. We don't know him. And there's nothing in our life for him. We're in a state, the word of God tells us, a state of rebellion. We're far from him. But the very first step that brings us on this path, this path of God changing us, is a step of personal faith. And you, you, you could go to John chapter 3, and you would find a very interesting man, a man called Nicodemus. He's a man who studied his Bible. He was a man who was a teacher of the Bible, and yet he hadn't taken the first step. And the Lord Jesus Christ said to him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. So it begins with conversion. It begins with that step. A step of personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ when we see our need as a sinner and we see that Christ died for us on the cross. But it continues. It continues. God continues to change us through the reading of that book that you have in front of you. Uh, it's, it's such an important book. It's not just facts about God, but it's a book that changes us. Maybe if you, if you flick back with me, would you? Or even just listen. Second Corinthians interesting little uh, letter second corinthians but i'm in chapter number three thinking about the way that god changes us he changes us firstly with that step of faith when we come to know the savior secondly he changes us through the word of god um in chapter three verse number 14 says um but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So here's a, a picture of people reading the Bible, if you like. Verse 18, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. How can God do a work in me? Number one, I take a step of faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. Secondly, get into this book, read it. Because as we read it and the Spirit of God takes that book, he begins to change us. He can mold us and shape us to be like the Lord Jesus, it says there in verse 18. Thirdly, not only through the Word of God, but also through your experiences. 
And I think that is where Paul is perhaps in Philippians. Because again, if you go down into 2 Corinthians in chapter number 4, look at the kind of experiences that the Apostle Paul is describing in chapter 4. Maybe all of us in our life can identify with at least some of this. But 2 Corinthians 4, 8, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. How does God change me? First and foremost, with a step of faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. Secondly, through the reading of the word of God. Thirdly, through the experiences that you and I are passing through. And in that chapter of 2 Corinthians 4, Paul describes trouble, verse 8. He descri describes distress, persecution, being depressed or cast down, discouraged. He describes being uh, tortured, bearing about in the body and so forth. But as he goes through those difficult experiences and trials of life, he sees that in his body, the Lord Jesus Christ has been shown. He's being changed. In other words, your despair is not pointless. Your life is not meaningless. Your struggle has a purpose and a hope. There is, there is a, a plan and there is a purpose in these difficult experiences that we pass through. Because in the hand of a God who's in control, he can use them to mold us, shape us and change us. And to make us something that we have never been before. And the person at the end of those struggles and, and at the end of those trials and difficulties is a very different person from the one at the beginning of those experiences. So says the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1 verse number 6, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And that can, of course, even be in the prison cell itself. So this prayer begins with thanksgiving. It continues with encouragement. And it's going to end with a bit of a challenge. A little bit of a challenge. Let's just drop our eyes, shall we, uh, down towards the end of that little section. Look at verse number nine. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ. So here's his little bit of challenge. Philippians, I'm glad that you're saved. I give thanks for you. I'm rejoicing in the, in, in, in the fact that you know the Lord Jesus. But there's maybe a little bit of a problem that you've got. And it's with this great subject of love. Love. I want that love to increase. Uh, verse number nine. But I would also like you to add something to that love that you've got. I want you to add knowledge and I want you to add judgment. Now that's very interesting. In that little verse, we learn this that love does not come prepackaged with discernment. Mm. Love does not come prepackaged with discernment. Love does not come or it is not part of love to judge. Now that's very, very important. Because of that, God can love us. <laughs> we don't have to reach a certain standard for God to love us. In fact, if you go back again to John chapter number three, you'll find that God so loved the world. If you go to the book of Romans, you'll find that it was whilst we were yet sinners that Christ died for the ungodly. So God's love extends towards us, not because we've reached a certain standard or because we're perfect. It's not because we're sinless, but his love goes out towards us. You see, the love of God began before sin. And the love of God continues after sin. The love of God has really nothing to do with sin. It's not restricted by sin. 
Sin cannot stop the love of God, otherwise sin would be greater than the love of God. So that would make no sense, wouldn't it not? But the love of God it transcends sin, it goes beyond sin, it is greater than sin, and it extends even to the sinner. God loved us and sent his son whilst we were yet sinners. Now that's good. Good to understand that to enjoy something of the love of God doesn't mean that I have to reach a standard. You don't. His love extends out towards us. In our Christian life, though, we've got to be very wary of this. We've got to realize that love does not come necessarily with discernment. Now, there's many a married man and many a married woman that's discovered this to their cost, of course. Not that long ago, someone came to speak to me <coughs> and the conversation went something like this I've made the discovery I've made the discovery that my husband has been unfaithful I thought made the discovery there's no discovery he's been unfaithful since the moment you met him He's been in many relationships ever before you met him. In fact, he left his wife to go with you. He's always been unfaithful. What do you mean you've made the discovery? You've realized something that you've ignored from the moment you met him. You see, in love, it doesn't come with judgment. It doesn't come with discernment. In fact, the word of God tells us that love covers a multitude of sins. And that's true. And it's glorious. It's a glorious truth. It's a great thing that God can love me and cover a multitude of sins. That's a tremendous thing. That's one of the powerhouses behind Calvary. But listen, what love cannot discern, what love cannot detect, love cannot judge nor discern. What love cannot detect, it cannot discern. That love is not looking into our heart, looking to detect sin. It extends towards us from the grace and the kindness of God. It is part of the very nature of God. It comes from the holiness and the purity of God. And because of that, it has nothing to do with sin. So as our love extends out, you've got to add to that discernment. You've got to be very careful. You've got to add that critical function to love. And you've really got to ask the question very, very carefully, exactly what am I loving? Is this a good thing? Because love, you see, goes beyond sin. It was there before sin. It will be there after sin. It is never restricted by sin. It is unconditional and it is received. And what that love cannot determine Detect, it cannot discern or judge. Now, the problem at Philippi was this, that sometimes they just were throwing their arms wide open and embracing everything and anything. <laughs> that can be dangerous. We love to welcome everyone to the cross of the Lord Jesus, but had you to go to Philippians chapter number three, in fact, uh, you maybe heard of that phrase, um, Wolves in sheep's clothing. <laughs> well, they were having that kind of a problem at Philippi. In Philippians chapter 3, verse number 2. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concession or the mutilation. So people were coming in. We'll come to it sometime in the future, we trust. But people were coming in with bad ideas. And people were coming in simply to exploit the church. They were looking to see what they could get out of it. That's what a dog is in the, in the Bible. It's, um, it's an opportunist, the dog. It's a scavenger. Uh, you go back into the Old Testament, you'll find dead bodies and the dogs come in and eat them. They're scavengers. They're not really interested in anything that's holy. There's, there's something easy to eat. We'll just go and get it. And the Philippians potentially were being opened up to that. Well, Philippians, I want you to grow not only in your love, but I want you too to add to that knowledge and judgment, discernment. I want you to look at what you're loving. I want you to be very careful that what you're loving is good. And sometimes you see in our society today, you'll hear phrases, phrases that are, well, they seem on the surface to be okay. You know, that, that 
love is love and uh, love can do no wrong and so forth. And it might seem to be that, that that seems a good thing to say. But the problem with love is it does not come prepackaged with discernment. It doesn't. And we've got to look at what we love. And we've got to be very careful. Is it right? Is it wrong? Because sometimes we can love the wrong and therein lies the problem. So Philippians, I want to encourage you. I'm giving thanks for you. We begin with thanksgiving. We're encouraged that no matter the experiences that God takes you through, they will be for your blessing and for your good. And I want you to, uh, to grow in your love towards one another. But do it, will you, Philippians, with discernment and with knowledge. Let's pray, shall we? Our Father, we come into thy presence this evening. We thank thee for the living word of God. We thank thee, our Father, uh, for this uh, uh, eavesdropping in on the prayer of the Apostle Paul there in the prison uh, uh, at Rome. And we ask, our Father, that thou would bless these words to us. We pray that we too might be encouraged by them. And we ask, our Father, that each of us uh, might know something of the joy of a living experience of thee. We can all look back, our Father, uh, on the path that we've been taking. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's challenging because of health, maybe disappointments, uh, sorrow, sadness, loss and bereavement. We can look back. Many of us here, our Father, in the past year or so have known many of these experiences, but we thank the our Father that our struggles, they are not futile, that there are there is purpose to our problems, that there is indeed design in the difficulties through which we're led. And we thank thee, our Father, that in thy loving kindness and grace, thou art able to take even the most difficult of experiences, shape us and mould us and change us. We pray that thou would bless the word of God to us as we offer thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.